Welcome to NASA Science Live. This is your opportunity to interact with NASA experts and have your questions answered in real time. I'm your host, Tahira Allen. Today, we're exploring NASA's Juno mission, which has been orbiting Jupiter for almost eight years. This has given it the unique opportunity to study two fascinating moons, one boasting lakes of lava on its surface, and the other thought to have a global liquid ocean hiding beneath its icy crust. Let's dive into the worlds of Europa and Io. Earlier this year, the Juno spacecraft conducted two ultra-close flybys of Jupiter's volcanic moon Io, capturing a wealth of data and the highest resolution images of its surface in over two decades. These flybys are the closest that a mission has come to the surface since a visit by the Galileo spacecraft in October 2001. The maneuvers have allowed Juno to study the most volcanically active world in our solar system, which is also only a little bit larger than Earth's moon. Io is caught in a tug of war between Jupiter's powerful gravity and the smaller pull from two neighboring moons. This constant stretch is churning its insides, creating volcanic eruptions and lakes of lava that cover its surface. Now, if Io is the world of fire, you can think of Europa as the world of ice. And just earlier this week, scientists released a new estimate for the amount of oxygen that's being produced on this moon using data collected by Juno in 2022. Europa is the destination of our upcoming Europa Clipper mission that's launching later this fall and is a world that is great of great interest to astrobiologists searching for signs of life in the universe. Scientists are almost certain that a vast ocean lies beneath Europa's icy shell as well as other ingredients for life as we know it, like chemistry and energy. These new findings are helping us better understand if this icy moon has conditions that could be favorable to life. Let's see how scientists are using Juno data to unravel the mysteries of these fascinating worlds. Now, if you have questions throughout today's show, you can submit them using the hashtag AskNASA on social media, or you can drop them directly into the comment box wherever you're watching. Today, we're joined by two special guests who are going to be answering those questions live on air. We have Dustin Buccino, a NASA Juno mission engineer and scientist. Welcome, just Dustin. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And Dr. Rosalie Lopez, a volcano expert and NASA Juno associate team member. Welcome, Rosalie. Thank you, and it's a pleasure to be here. And thank you both so much for being here with us today. Can you start off by telling our viewers a little bit about your individual roles with the Juno mission? Dustin, let's start with you. So what I do, I have two hats on Juno. I My first role is the gravity instrument engineer. So I'm responsible for collecting all of the data and processing the data for the gravity science investigations we do, which is measuring the interior structures of Jupiter and its moons. Uh, I'm also uh, a part of the science planning working group where we take all of the science objectives that we want to accomplish on any given orbit around Jupiter and combine them into a cohesive plan that we can give to the engineering team to uh, execute. And what about you, Rosalie? I also have two hats. Uh, the first is my job here at JPL is deputy director uh, for the Planetary Science Directorate, and Juno is one of our missions, so the success of Juno is very important to me. But the other, which is actually more fun, is a collaborator on the science of Juno. Um, Scott Bolton, the PI of Juno, and I uh, worked together back on Galileo days, and uh, because of my expertise on IO, he invited me to uh, help out uh, the Juno scientists, and uh, and that's been great. You know, Rosalie, talking about your expertise with Io, I know you've done a lot of research on this moon, even winning a world record for the amount of active volcanoes you've discovered. Can you tell us why is NASA so interested in this world? Io is a really interesting and rather weird, unique moon. It's the most volcanically active object in the solar system. Uh, we may think that the Earth has a lot of volcanoes, but Io has 
bigger volcanoes, bigger lava flows, they are erupting all the time, uh, gigantic plumes, volcanic plumes uh, above the surface. Uh, and, um, uh, and we think that um, uh, some of the uh, eruptions on Io are very similar to the eruptions on Earth uh, in the Earth's early history, like hundreds of millions to billions of years ago. And even the composition of the lava uh, may be very similar to primitive lavas on Earth. So looking at Io gives us a way to uh, look at the early Earth and study eruptions that don't exist anymore on Earth. That is so cool to think about. And so I understand too, it's due to Io's unique position in this Jupiter system that really has to deal with its volcanoes and it, its inner mechanics. And so Dustin, I know you focus a lot on the Jovian system. So again, Jupiter, its rings, its moons. Can you explain the significance of Io and Europa within this system? So Io drives so much of what's happening uh, in the Jovian system. Uh, as Rosalie mentioned, Io has a lot of volcanoes and it erupts and, uh, and creates um, these, these, these plumes, which are then create the atmosphere of Io. Uh, this atmosphere gets stripped away because Jupiter is rotating very quickly and has a large magnetic field. And Jupiter's magnetic field actually takes these particles that are being erupted by Io and emits them uh, and ionizes them into the magnetic field. And once they are uh, ionized and charged, they get to move around along these magnetic field lines. And they create these large amounts of plasma that then um, are move around the Jovian system, creates radiation hazards for when we fly our spacecraft through there. But also, uh, these particles then get um, in the right position, they get moved along the magnetic field lines into Jupiter itself. And they hit Jupiter at the poles and create these massive auroras, just like we see on Earth with the auroras. There are auroras on Jupiter that are, that are even larger. And it puts a lot of energy into the, into the Jovian atmosphere through this mechanism. And it, it, it really is a full circle approach to this. And so I want to now pivot a little bit and talk about Europa. So just this week, NASA released new science from Juno's 2022 flyby of the moon. And this data indicated that the ice covered moon generates about a thousand tons of oxygen every 24 hours. So that's enough to keep a million humans breathing for a day. Dustin, what is the key takeaway here? So the key takeaway here is really, you know, Europa is producing oxygen. And one of the interesting things about Europa is that the surface is ice. And underneath that surface, we believe there is a large liquid water ocean. And on Earth here, where there's water, there is life. And, and we, we believe that could be the case on Europa. So we want to find out you know, how, how habitable is Europa. Now, this paper uh, looked at a very interesting way of, of figuring out how much oxygen their production there is when these same charged particles that I just talked about that are moving around the Jovian system impact that ice on Europa. It splits the ice, which is composed of hydrogen and oxygen combined, H2O. It splits it into hydrogen and oxygen. And some of that oxygen can propagate through the ice into the ocean of Europa. And that creates the potentially conditions for life. I mean, just some fascinating workings going on on these two moons. And we have a ton of questions coming in from our viewers online right now. So let's hop right into this Q&A. As a reminder to those watching live, you can submit your own questions for Dustin and Rosalie using the hashtag AskNASA on social media, or you can drop your question directly into the comment box wherever you're watching. All right, our first question is from Andrew K. Tyler on Facebook, who asks, where will Juno go after Io? Dustin. So Juno is continuing to orbit around Jupiter and Every time we orbit, um, what Io did to our orbit was actually when we flew by Io uh, uh, in 2020, in December 2023, and in February of this year, it actually shrunk our orbital period. We are in a larger orbit, and now Io, we we did a grab when we fly by that close, it alters Juno's trajectory, and so we're actually going to shrink our orbit, and so we're going to be by Jupiter faster than we used to be, and. We're
we're going to be taking a measure of Jupiter to understand its interior structure and its magnetic field and all these particles that occur close in. And so as a follow-up, um, we have Ridman on YouTube who asks, you know, we've been studying Io with Juno. Are there any ice volcanoes on Europa, Rosalie? Oh, good question. Uh, yes, we have seen uh, features that can be interpreted as uh, ice volcanoes, or we call this cryovolcanism because it's a cold volcanism. It, essentially, volcanism is the process that brings material from the interior to the surface. Uh, so if your interior has um, uh, magma like Io and F, then it, it when it comes to the surface, that molten rock uh, will be lava. But because Europa has liquid water under its ice crust, uh, what comes to the surface is, uh, you know, either a plume uh, of vapor or uh, sort of slushy ice. Um, uh, you can think of it that way. And uh, it's uh, there have been a number of studies, even. Um, uh, some evidence showing that uh, plumes may be erupting uh, from Europa. Uh, but, you know, we haven't found that, uh, 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 that proof yet. And that's one of the things that uh, Europa Clipper will be looking for, both evidence of uh, cryovolcanoes on the surface and also uh, plumes uh, coming out uh, of the surface. And so while we're on this topic of Europa, we have Ridman on YouTube who asks, is Europa pulled like Io with this gravitational pull, Dustin? Yes. Yeah, so the mechanism uh, that we talked about on Io, which is this, what we, we call it tidal heating. And so the orbit around that, that Io and Europa take around Jupiter is not perfectly uh, uh, circular. It's off by a little bit. And so when the moons get closer to Jupiter, they are they are subject to what we call tidal heating. So the 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 moon is essentially being pulled by Jupiter and squished almost, and that creates a, a some heat. And that heat creates on Io the molten the molten rock that we see in the volcanoes, and on Europa, uh, which is farther away than Io, and so it it's it's not as large of a magnitude of effect, but it's still there. And that tidal heating creates the liquid ocean that we believe exists under the crust. That's incredible. And so we do, we have Benjamin Wilson on Facebook who wants to know, how are we going to get under this icy ocean, uh, under this ice to the ocean of Europa? And will we be able to do it remotely? Um, <laughs> Dustin, do you wanna take that one? So there are, there are ways that we can look under the surface without having to go there. We would obviously love to go there and just you know look at the water and, and look at samples. Um, but we can do what we call remote sensing techniques to sort of look under the surface. So the Europa Clipper spacecraft and Juno have instruments that are able to do that. So what I work on is the, is the gravity science. And so that's measuring the interior structure of these moons and measuring this tidal heating effect that occurs. And we can do that by essentially measuring the position of the spacecraft. And we measure the position of the spacecraft very precisely with, um, by measuring the Doppler shift to Earth on the radio signal. And from doing that, uh, we're measuring essentially the spacecraft's position, velocity, and acceleration. And that gives us how much gravity was experienced. And so if you're standing on the surface of Earth, you're, you're being pulled by all the particles around you, all the way to the center. And so if we measure this gravity field um, on a global scale around the two moons, we can actually determine what the interior structures look like and how much liquid there is relative to solid and what kinds of solids, what's the density of the solids. Other instruments, such as um, Juno's microwave radiometer, are able to look a little bit below the surface uh, to see differences in the ice at depth. Um, and missions like the Europa Clipper will have an ice penetrating radar uh, to look below the surface as well. So we're talking a lot about how we're going to be studying this moon, but Rosalie, can you give us an idea of why Europa? Why, why is NASA so interested in going to this ice covered moon? Uh, we're very interested in Europa because it's what we call an ocean world and Europa, Europa's ocean 
may actually have life is one of the most promising places in the solar system for life. Uh, you know, as uh, we were saying before, uh, there is this tidal heating. And uh, uh, so Europa's interior also suffers though to a much less extent than Io from this uh, tidal heating. Uh, there may be um, um, a volcanism in the, in the deep interior of Europa. If you have water, you have heat, uh, energy, those are some of the ingredients that uh, you need for life. And the Galileo mission actually was the mission that found the that Europa had this liquid ocean under a nice crust and uh, became very, very exciting. Well, it's it's so exciting again, too, to think that we're now, you know, months away from launching back to studying this moon with Clipper. And I want to take us back to Juno now. So we have Lydity on YouTube who asks, how did Juno manage to function way past its intended lifetime? Dustin? So Juno, um, Juno was designed to last uh, a, a certain number of orbits around Jupiter, and we've lasted a lot longer than that. Um, Juno is a very um, well-designed spacecraft. We designed the spacecraft to go to this intense environment around Jupiter. Um, it has a, a vault that um, protects all of the electronics from Jupiter's radiation in the space environment, essentially bringing what, what would be um, you know, a death sentence to a computer and, and preventing it from being hit by all these particles. And so Juno has been, um, you know, we, we fly the spacecraft very well and safely, and we, we keep monitoring and, and watching for these effects. And uh, you know, it, it's all a matter of the engineering and how well it was put together. Um, and so it's a very well-built spacecraft and we're seeing uh, it last longer um, because of the way we fly it and because of uh, the design with the radiation vault. And so I have a, I have a great follow-up really quickly. Mohammed on Lee on Facebook who wants to know, what is the velocity of Juno in orbit? Okay, so Juno um, is in what we call an elliptical orbit. Um, it comes in very close to Jupiter uh, only uh, once per orbit. And when it is close to Jupiter, it is traveling at around 50 kilometers per second. It's very, very fast. And so we that is also how we have survived so long around Jupiter. So if we go in really fast, we collect our data, and then get out, and then we have a lot of time away from the intense radiation to send the data back and do remote observations from a distance. And so that is, uh, that's how we are able also to help with that. And Rosalie, we have Moshark who asks, how much longer will Juno be active? Oh, well, um, <laughs> uh, that's maybe more of a question for a Dustin, but um, you know, uh, it's, uh, there are limits uh, based on the amount of radiation that uh, Juno can withstand, you know, and, uh, you know, and there is always the um, limit of, uh, you know, funding as well. But we hope that um, Juno will be around for a, a while longer. And these missions, by the way, uh, they, they are very well engineered and they tend to last longer than uh, we uh, then we think. For example, Galileo lasted a lot longer. Uh, the Mars Exploration Rovers, uh, again, yeah. you know, lasted a lot longer than we expected. So uh, we build them well. And, uh, uh, you know, we uh, uh, put, put a lot of work and, uh, and thought into that engineering. Uh, because these uh, missions are very expensive and, um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, so if they last longer, you get more out of them. Absolutely. And so I have a great follow up, you know, talking about this incredible engineering. We have Taylor T69420 on X who asks, what kind of radiation hardening is used to allow probes to survive the Jovian system? Dustin. So uh, the, the, the quick answer to that is several hundred pounds of aluminum and titanium to protect all of the electronics. Um, the Juno mission has what I call this radiation vault and it is, can, it is composed of titanium to protect uh, all of the electronics that we put into Juno. And so that's one step. The other step is all of our 
spacecraft that we design have re what we call redundancy in them. So if a if we get hit by radiation or if we get hit by a particle or something that causes damage to a component on the spacecraft, all of the critical components of the spacecraft, there are generally two of them. So we have two radio communicators to Earth. We have two radios to Earth. We have two computers, you know, two data handling systems and all of these. So if one goes down, in fact, the spacecraft will autonomously detect that something's wrong with what's happening and it will switch wow. to the what, the backup. And so uh, we can either command that to happen or uh, if it happens and, it, and, and the spacecraft thinks it's gonna um, end up hurting itself by maintain trying to use the current device, it will switch to the other one. And so we have this, what we call redundancy, and we also have the radiation hardening. It is fascinating to honestly hear, you know, just the engineering involved in these spacecraft missions. Dustin, can you tell us how long from maybe like concept design to build finish did it take to even come up with Juno? I don't, I've, I've been on Juno since uh, orbit insertion. So that's, it's been uh, since 2016, um, just prior to that is when I started. Uh, before that, you know, the mission launched in 2011 and the concept and design and, and proposal was many years before that. So these are, these are decades long projects that, that, that takes, it takes a lot of time to design the mission, the concept, put it together and, and build it and then launch it. And once you launch it, you still have to wait a very long time to get to Jupiter. And so this is often a decades long process. Yeah. And so going back to this, you know, always um, the radiation question and how we're protecting spacecraft against radiation from Jupiter is, could this technology be used to protect humans if we one day venture out there ourselves? Um, Rosalie or Dustin for that one? Well, uh, if, I... we, uh, if we go to uh, Europa or Io, we're certainly going to have to protect the humans. I mean, the, the radiation dose at Io would kill you in a day. <laughs> so um, you would have to protect the humans very well. And I'm not sure what exactly you would use, uh, yeah. but uh, maybe by then uh, we'll have even better uh, ways or better uh, uh, materials. Uh, Dustin, anything to add? Yeah, I mean, you know, when Juno flies by Jupiter, we get about 150,000 dental x-rays worth of radiation in a very, very short period. Um, it's a lot of radiation, and so we definitely would need to protect. And, you know, right now we're using, you know, metals to do that. But as Rosalie mentioned, maybe there will be future materials uh, that we will discover that will help us protect humans. And so, to you mentioned it, like, when talking about Juno flying by Jupiter, we have Swedgy on YouTube who asks, what is the propulsion that is used uh, on, on Juno? And how do you navigate between these moons and Jupiter? Uh, Dustin. So uh, we use what well, just standard on Juno. It's just what we call standard chemical propulsion. Um, it's just, it's, it's a rocket. We use uh, combined fuel and an oxidizer together and burn and uh, through the rocket nozzle. And that provides us thrust. Um, Juno is a very elegantly designed mission in that we don't need to do a whole lot of that while we are at Jupiter. We use a lot of fuel to get there and to enter orbit in 2016, but that we're there, Juno is mostly on what we call a ballistic trajectory. So what we do is we fly the spacecraft and Jupiter pulls on it, the moons pull on Juno, and that just naturally causes the spacecraft to keep flying in a particular orientation. Every orbit, we uh, take uh, analysis of, the, what this, of what the spacecraft's position is, and we measure that by sending a radio signal from Juno to Earth at a given frequency, and we know when that was sent and what frequency it was sent at, and what we, when we receive it on Earth at these massive antennas at NASA's Deep Space Network, um, we can receive that signal, and the frequency we received is different than what was sent, and so that tells us the spacecraft's velocity. And then it, we also know when it was received. And so if you know when the signal was sent and when it was received, that's the distance to the spacecraft. And so we measure what we call range and Doppler measurements to determine the spacecraft's trajectory. And then we can carefully navigate that spacecraft to where we wanna go relatively close to what that ballistic trajectory was. So we make little corrections every single orbit in order to maintain what we uh, wanna do for our science. 
And so I want to take us back. We have a lot of interest coming in right now on Europa. And I have Carrie Ann on YouTube who wants to know, will there ever be an attempt to get samples from the plumes um, on Europa? Uh, uh, Rosalie. I, yeah, I can take that. That's a very interesting question. Uh, but uh, the problem with plumes on Europa is that, uh, well, first of all, we still have to confirm that these plumes are there and, uh, and they seem to come and go. So you can't really plan a sample collecting mission uh, unless you actually know that the plume is going to be there for a long time. Um, so in fact, we are doing a study at the moment about a sample collecting, uh, a sample collecting mission uh, to collect a sample from um, uh, Io, because on Io we know that there are some plumes that last a very long time. Uh, for example, one of them, uh, the Prometheus plume, was active when Voyager flew by in 1979, and every mission that flies by, uh, Galileo, um, New Horizons, Juno, everyone sees Prometheus being active. Uh, so uh, that you can plan for because it, you, it's a reasonable assumption that the plume uh, will still be active. Are you able to give us a little details on like how the sampling uh, mission could work? Well, you would have to send a, a spacecraft there. Uh, we, we have ways of collecting samples while the sp spacecraft flies through a plume uh, and, uh, uh, and, and then uh, the spacecraft comes back to Earth, drops off the capsule, uh, and, um, uh, and then that's analyzed in laboratories. Uh, we, we can send very good spacecraft to uh, the, the planets, uh, but we can't send the kind of instrumentation that we have on laboratories on Earth. And, uh, and that's why, you know, we have been collecting samples from asteroids like OSIRIS-REx has come back with uh, samples that are being analyzed now, uh, and also the Hayabusa missions from Japan, uh, and bring back uh, rocks from Mars so they can be analyzed in laboratories on Earth. And so sticking with this topic of science of these two moons. Jay Word on YouTube asks, is there any tectonic plate activity on either Europa or Io? And if so, what kind of natural formations have formed due to it? Rosalie? Yeah, I can take that. Uh, we see mountains on Io, uh, but seeing mountains means there is some tectonic activity, but not plate tectonics. Uh, mm. And on Europa, we see a lot of folds uh, 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 on the cracks on the surface, and uh, uh, and people who have studied those uh, cracks and the morphology say that okay, the the the, the crust uh, uh, has been you know cracked, and these uh, pieces have moved around because they're floating on top of the ocean. So it's a little bit like you you see on Earth with uh, uh, you know ice for example, near uh, Antarctica. Uh, and, uh, but plate tectonics is something that we have not seen uh, on any other body uh, outside the Earth. Uh, so that seems to be very specific uh, to the Earth. And uh, it's a very interesting question about why. Uh, maybe because we need a lot of um, uh, water on Earth for this uh, to lubricate the, these plates, particularly in the sub subduction zones, one plate diving under the other. Um, uh, we, uh, you know, m need uh, perhaps a, a certain thickness of crust relative to the size of the planet. Uh, so, uh, for example, when you know Europa, the uh, the, the ice maybe is too thin. Uh, although there have been suggestions of subduction on Europa, it's possible. Uh, on Mars, the crust is too thick. Uh, so uh, you need that kind of uh, Goldilocks uh, for plate tectonics to, to take place. 
And a, a great follow up. We have Universe on X who wants to know how thick is the ice layer on Europa? Dustin? So uh, we don't really know exactly for sure. That's one thing that we want to get a better answer to is how thick is it truly, but we believe it's on the order of something like 10 to 20 kilometers. Wow. And so taking it back to Juno, what are the tools that Juno has on board? This is from Scientific Potato. So Juno has uh, a, a lot of instruments on board. And Juno's instruments were designed to look at Jupiter primarily. And so uh, we have um, we call it the gravity science, which is what I do, which is tries to measure the uh, the gravity fields of the objects that we're flying by. Juno also has a microwave radiometer, which probes um, the atmosphere of Jupiter and also, of course, the, the structure of the surfaces on the moons. We also have a magnetometer at the at the end of the boom there. The one solar panel that looks a little different is the magnetometer the magnetic field of Jupiter. Uh, we also have a couple of cameras. We have an infrared camera called GIRAM, and we have a, uh, a, a visible camera called JunoCam. There's also um, a suite of particle uh, sensors, uh, high energy and low energy particle detectors. And then we also have um, uh, a plasma wave sensor uh, instrument, which measures the, the, the electrical fields that the uh, spacecraft is experiencing. Um, and I think I missed, uh, I might have missed one or, or, or two, uh, but we also have another uh, star camera that looks uh, at, 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 the, at the, both Jupiter and the moons uh, a little more uh, detailed. So all in all though, we have a ton of science going on. And you know, we have Elle on YouTube who asks, given the signal delay, how are you able to control Juno? Dustin. So Juno, um, we don't actively control Juno as if we're, you know, we call it, we're not joysticking it. We don't send it a command and wait for, uh, wait for mm. it to do it. And then we send it back. It takes 45 minutes roughly for a signal that we send from earth to reach Juno. And then another 45 minutes for it to come back all the way to earth. So we can't um, actively control the spacecraft in that way. What we do is we send it a command uh, of se a sequence command, which um, generally lasts about a week, uh, somewhere between one week and four weeks long and it generally covers one orbit around Juno around Jupiter and that that command sequence ha instructs the spacecraft to do everything that it should do in that time period so whether it be a week whether it be a month uh, it does all those commands within that time period and so every time it's while we're already while it's executing a one month plan or a three week plan we're already planning the next one and we're generating that set of commands and so it all will happen on that cadence. There are times where we will command it more um, frequently. And um, those mm -hmm. are for things like when we're doing these orbit correction maneuvers, or if there's an anomaly and we need to respond to it, um, we then uh, you know, send commands on a more frequent basis. But the general uh, structure is you, you, it's, uh, it's largely just flying there and automated uh, on this command set. Wow. And so I, ha I have a follow-up for you, Rosalie. It's elevated one on YouTube who wants to know how powerful is Juno now compared to the Voyager spacecrafts, for example? Uh, well, I, I wouldn't say powerful is, a, uh, is the right term. Uh, Voyager flew by. Uh, so Voyager okay. was a flyby. It flew by the Jupiter system. So the amount of data it could take was limited. Uh, mm. Now, uh, Galileo was a Jupiter orbiter uh, like Juno, uh, so Galileo uh, got a lot of data, you know, on Europa and Io. Uh, but uh, the uh, the the more recent spacecraft, of course, have more uh, uh, later technology and better instrumentation. Uh, mm. So uh, you always get a lot of improvement, and also. Uh, the previous missions tell you what science questions you're trying to answer. So when you design the next mission, uh, you're going like, I want to answer these science questions that um, uh, we couldn't answer with the last mission. Uh, so you tailor your instruments uh, to those science questions. And the, the science questions are always the starting point uh, for any new mission or any new uh, mission planning. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, 
Juno uh, is uh, gathering a lot of uh, exceptional data on, uh, uh, on Europa uh, and Io that uh, Voyager could not get because um, when Voyager flew by, Voyager was a very exploratory mission. Uh, it didn't even know what it was going to find. Uh, and mm -hmm. for example, with Europa Clipper, now we know a lot more about Europa uh, from Galileo uh, and, and somewhat more from Juno as well. And uh, uh, so uh, the instruments were designed, uh, you know, for example, an radar uh, to tell you uh, uh, about the thickness of the ice layer. Uh, and I will stress that Juno was not designed to look at the satellites. This was really a great opportunity. And, and I think Dustin can talk more about that. Mm. Yeah, so Juno uh, was designed to look at Jupiter. And uh, in the original mission, we would not be actually flying by any of these moons. Um, but because Juno has lasted so long, we now have this unique opportunity. And we, of course, we were going to take advantage of that to fly by these Galilean moons in order to look at them in more detail. And so talking again about just instruments and the science that is building on top of each other, we have a question from Justin on YouTube who wants to know what instruments and techniques could be used to check for life on Europa? So instrument wise, um, we, 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 there's no such thing right now as a life detecting instrument. Life is very complex on earth and we can look and detect life. But what we're actually looking for is what are the conditions to allow for life to exist mm -hmm. and do those exist on Europa as an example. So we want to really look at is Europa potentially habitable? So on earth, we, we can go and look at all of these extreme locations. And in general, everywhere we look on Earth, there is life. <laughs> and so uh, what are the conditions on Europa and are they compatible with the conditions that we know of that life could exist? And so we're looking at things like temperature, a chemical composition of the, uh, of, of the uh, ocean uh, and the surface, the icy surface, uh, to sort of to determine um, you know, what, is it habitable? That's the real question we're trying to get at. Um, and I really hope that um, you know a lot of um, instrument developers and, and and engineers and and you know future future engineers can come up with these yeah. new and ways to develop techniques to actually detect life. And I have a great follow up to that for you, Rosalie. We have Connemara on YouTube who asks, "What is being done to potentially protect the life that could be present at Europa?" Oh, uh, you know, we have uh, uh, what we call planetary protection. In fact, mm -hmm. is, a, is a kind of international agreement uh, that we're going to protect these worlds. Uh, and uh, uh, so we take planetary protection very, very seriously. Um, mm -hmm. Now, uh, for example, some people ask, why um, we killed the Galileo spacecraft by sending it inside Jupiter, and we killed the Cassini spacecraft by sending it inside Saturn. And the reason was planetary protection. Uh, Galileo found that uh, you know, Europa could possibly have life, so we couldn't risk leaving it around the Jupiter system. One day it could crash on Europa, and the spacecraft had not been sterilized, so we thought, the best way, the safest way is to kill it. Uh, same thing with Saturn, uh, that uh, the Galileo mission, sorry, the Cassini mission uh, found that um, uh, uh, Titan and Enceladus uh, might have life. Uh, so again, in the end, we uh, killed the, uh, <laughs> the, the spacecraft by sending it inside Saturn so that it would not contaminate. Uh, so I've been through two of those because I, I worked on Cassini as well. So maybe Dustin can um, uh, talk more about um, uh, Juno. So for Juno, we um, of course have the same planetary protection requirements. And um, you know, after our mission 
if the extended mission is over, we will have to do something to protect Europa um, and the other moons from our spacecraft, which was built, mm -hmm. you know, very cleanly, but um, we don't want to take that risk. We, you know, we don't want to go to Europa in 20 years with these amazing new technologies that we would be developing and only, and say we found life and turns out it was, we brought it there. We didn't, we don't want to, we don't want to do that. So we will have to find a way to protect Europa. Um, and we, we are already working on that, um, on what's the best way to um, prevent, you know, Juno from impacting Europa or contaminating it. Now, Blue Lightning on YouTube has a great follow-up who wants to know if we ever do discover life in Europa's oceans, what kind of life would we be expecting, Rosalie? Oh, uh, well, we don't know that, but we don't think that uh, we would find whales. <laughs> we are expecting uh, microbial life. Uh, mm -hmm. So, um, uh, you know, not... Uh, uh, you know, not whales, although sometimes we, we joke about whales on the, uh, on Europa, uh, but uh, no, the, the life would likely be uh, primitive. Uh, we find life, for example, uh, 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 in the Earth's oceans uh, very deep uh, around hydrothermal uh, vents. Um, so maybe that's something that uh, we might find on Europa, but we're a, a long way from um, I, 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 speculating uh, mm -hmm. what kind of life uh, we would uh, we would find there. But um, what's something that I find very interesting about life is that uh, it usually finds a way. Uh, we, uh, we find life in places on Earth that we wouldn't expect. And, uh, you know, for example, um, you know, decades ago, no one thought that life uh, could exist in this uh, deep, deep into the Earth's uh, oceans until the discovery of uh, these hydrothermal vents and life around them. And a colleague of mine once said, if no one had ever seen a fish, you wouldn't think that life could exist uh, in the ocean. Uh, so we don't know what we're going to find, but that's, uh, that's what makes it so exciting. Yeah, that's part of the journey. And so, you know, Dustin, I understand you do study, you know, the inner workings of Europa and the ocean. And so I have a great question for you from Strong Monty on YouTube, who wants to know, wouldn't the ocean of Europa already have plenty of oxygen if it is H2O? That's a great question. Um, you know, H2O is water. We as humans and life can't breathe H2O directly unless you are something like a fish. Um, you need to be able to have <laughs> oxygen itself. And if you, you can actually dissolve oxygen in water. And so that also is where it comes into is you can actually pull those oxygen molecules separately out. And so why does it need more oxygen from the surface? to be able to support life? Well, we just think that's the one of the mechanisms that oxygen can get into the ocean. We will learn a lot more from Europa Clipper um, when, when it gets there on how, that, how more, all the mechanisms that may, that may generate oxygen. And so we've been talking a lot about these observations from orbit. And I have a question from Aldo Wakil Van Hand on Facebook wants to know, is there a way to zoom in really close on either of these worlds and see what's on the ground? Rosalie or Dustin? So, so yes, um, you know, if you, if you have a, a, a camera that can do that, you absolutely can zoom in. And Europa Clipper has a, what we call a narrow angle camera, which is essentially more just like a camera with a telescope. And it can zoom in very closely on the surface of Europa. A lot of the resolution that comes out of pretty much any uh, flyby uh, from any spacecraft is how far away are you from the moon? And so the closer you get, the higher resolution image you can get. And so with Juno, we got about 350 kilometers from Europa's surface. And uh, the JunoCam instrument um, took many amazing photos of the surface at very high resolution uh, in certain regions um, to help you know, fill in the gaps, so to speak, of, of, from what we had previously. 
and Europa Clipper is going to get even closer to the surface. So we're going to really be able to zoom in and see very, very high resolution images. Wow. And we received some pretty high resolution images recently, right, from Juno with IO. Um, and so I understand there is a um, there's a public engagement component of this mission, right? Dustin, could you talk a little bit yes, about so Juno Cam? So Juno Cam is um, an instrument uh, that's a camera. It's it's not too dissimilar actually from your cell phone's camera in a way. And what it does um, is it takes pictures of of the various moons and Jupiter itself. Uh, but what it does uh, is as soon as those images come down uh, and are transmitted back from Juno to Earth and are decoded in at the Deep Space Network's telemetry into and sent back to our computers here at JPL, they pretty much go straight up to uh, the internet, um, to the Mission Juno website, where anybody uh, can download them and process them into, uh, you know, taking wow. creative approaches, um, you know, the scientific approaches to really piece out, you know, all the different channels and all the all the all of the uh, components of the JunoCam data and make their own images and post them back to the website. Now, Rosalie, we have Peter on YouTube who wants to know what percentage of Jupiter's moons has Juno mapped? How many has has it observed? Well, uh, Juno has um, obtained images from uh, Io, Europa, also Ganymede, uh, mm. and uh, uh, and you know, and and some of these images uh, filled in gaps that uh, we didn't have uh, at sufficiently high resolution from um, uh, Galileo. Uh, and uh, so uh, they, although they didn't get as much data as Galileo did, uh, you know, they got, you know, very, very useful data, um, you know, particularly for mapping. And we, we uh, use images to map the geology of the surface and the different terrains. Um, so uh, it's, it's it's really been a gift that uh, uh, the Juno Extended Mission was able to uh, get such images of the satellites and also other data. Uh, Justin mentioned microwave radiometer, and uh, uh, I collaborate with the GRAM, an Italian instrument that's a, a thermal infrared instrument. And uh, again, you know, we got amazing data. Uh, from Io, uh, so it's it's really been a, a an amazing gift uh, that uh, we um, uh, use Juno to look at the moons. And so you had mentioned Ganymede, and so I have a great fantastic, uh, I have a great follow up question for you. Stephen Jackson on Facebook wants to know: Will there be any additional observations of the largest moon, Ganymede? And you know, I believe NASA has a mission called JUICE that will look into this, right? Uh, I'll, I'll let Dustin uh, answer that question, but I just want to say that JUICE is an European Space Agency mission. Mm -hmm. NASA uh, has instruments on it, uh, so there is a lot of collaboration, but it's actually an ESA mission. And it is going to uh, go to the Jupiter system and eventually orbit Ganymede. Uh, so it's going to really focus on studying Ganymede, but we'll also get some images of uh, Europa and Io. Amazing. Anything you'd add, Dustin? So Juno uh, did a close encounter with Ganymede in, tw in 2021 in the summer, and um, we got some really nice data from that. Um, we won't be able to go back, unfortunately. Um, so we had the one shot at, at, at seeing Ganymede with Juno. But as, as was mentioned, um, the European Space Agency JUICE mission, um, which there are NASA components on, um, will be looking at Ganymede in, in very uh, detail. And so I have a fun question um, to follow up on. We have IDLS on YouTube who wants to know, where did these two moons, Europa and Io, get their names from? Rosalie? Uh, well, those are names from Greek mythology. Uh, in fact, uh, Jupiter was the, um, uh, like the, the king of the gods in Greek and then Roman mythology. Uh, and uh, um, you know, and he, um, 
let's say that he was, uh, you know, a bit of a philanderer. He wasn't particularly <laughs> faithful to his wife. And his wife, in fact, was called Juno. Uh, and uh, uh, so oh, the wow. moons are named, yeah, the moons are named after uh, some of his uh, lovers. Uh, and uh, and poor Ayo was a, a nymph that eventually got turned into a cow by Juno. <laughs> oh man, that is that is a fun fact. Thank you for that, Rosalie. And so I want to take it back to the science of the two moons. Again, we've got a lot of interest coming in for uh, Europa. And so we have robust brain on X who asks, "Do we know what the planetary core is uh, made of on Europa?" Dustin. So we believe Europa has um, a solid core uh, composed of what we call, you know, ro it's more rocky elements, what we might mm -hmm. be more used to. Is it the same as the center of our Earth? Um, maybe, but probably not. Um, and so that's one thing that the, uh, Euro that the uh, Europa Clipper mission will be doing is mapping out the interior structure of Europa. You know, how many layers are there? How deep is the ocean? How deep is the uh, ice crust? And how big is that, you know, the core of, of Europa? And Wine Spring on X wants to know, where did the ice come from on Europa? Rosalie? Uh, well, uh, water uh, and ice are very, you know, common uh, elements in the uh, solar system. Uh, so it really came from the uh, solar nebula, from the formation uh, of the Jupiter system. Uh, we think that th those moons were uh, formed in the same part of the solar nebula uh, as uh, Jupiter, uh, but Io has no water, uh, so they ended up very different, which is which is interesting. Uh, and uh, but again, if we look at our solar system, th the planets are all uh, very different. And so my next question is from Miss Land's classroom. We've touched on this earlier, but for those just tuning in, would, would NASA be able to create a spacecraft or a machine to check for life under the ice layer on Europa? Dustin? Uh, yes, that is certainly uh, possible. And that, that could be a potential follow-on mission to the Europa Clipper mission, where we would design something to land on the surface of Europa and take samples directly and and do what we call you know in situ measurements of you know what then you then you can use you know direct measurements of the ice and potentially if you land in the right spot uh drill through and get water samples and that would be very interesting um uh, data in order to determine you know habitability or life and so i have another follow-up question from miss land's class a great one for both of you what would you say is the most interesting data or images that Juno has been able to collect. Rosalie, we'll start with you and then would love to hear your thoughts, Dustin. Well, uh, of course, I'm, I'm prejudiced. I love Io. <laughs> so I think that the, the yeah. images of Io were the most interesting mm -hmm. that Juno mm -hmm. ever collected. Uh, in terms of, uh, you know, scientifically valuable, uh, you can argue that. Uh, that uh, Juno was a mission to study Jupiter, uh, and uh, uh, so it found a, a lot of new things about Jupiter itself. So the moons are kind of like a, a bonus. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, the, as I said before, the mission was not designed to study the moons. Uh, but I think that the images we got of Io, not just the camera images, but the data from GRAM, uh, for example, has shown us that Io has a lot more lava lakes than we knew of uh, from Galileo. Uh, and I'll let Dustin uh, give his opinion. Yeah, so that's always going to be an opinionated uh, response to, to a question like that. On <laughs> what, what's, what's the most interesting data? Um, you know, I, I would say uh, we're all a little biased in that way. So I'm going to actually choose um, what we discovered on what the gravity science of Jupiter, which determined the interior of Jupiter, and that's um, you know it was not what we expected at all. There's you know, we we see that the zones and belts around Jupiter penetrate very deeply into the surface. It's not just uh, right on the. It's not just like a weather layer. You know these these zones and belts they penetrate three thousand kilometers into the into the uh, 
structure of, um, of Jupiter. Um, my favorite image is actually what was just shown there, which is the pole. You know, we never would able, were able to really look at the pole of Jupiter, as, and Juno flew right over the pole, and as soon as we got those pictures wow. of over the pole, of, of of Jupiter, it's just astonishing. You can see all of these uh, cyclones wow. or anti-cyclones um, just, just visibly right there on the surface. That's not something that you can see from Earth. You have to go there and, and put a camera on the pole in order to see it. And that was just mind boggling to me when I saw that image. And I have, again, another biased, quick final question for you both from OV101 Enterprise on X who wants to know which one of the Galilean moons is your favorite? Dustin, we'll start with you. Rosalie, I think we could guess that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm gonna have to go with uh, Europa on this one. Um, you know, we it's oh. it's an ocean world that, that we can access and we're planning a mission to it. And there's gonna be so many interesting data that come out of that. Um, you know, it, it, it's a strong candidate for their potential to be life and I just love looking at the surface of it. It just looks, you know, it looks so <laughs> alien and foreign and you see all these cracks and ridges and I, I, that's my favorite Galilean moon. And Rosalie, what about you? Well, well, of course, Io is my favorite moon and, uh, and hey, it looks like a pizza. Uh, in fact, it was nicknamed the pizza moon. So if you like pizza, you, uh, you like Io. Uh, and uh, it, it's just uh, for volcanologists is absolutely mm -hmm. heaven. Uh, we we have uh, so many volcanoes and so many weird formations that uh, you don't see anywhere else uh, in the solar system. And uh, and a, a, a surface that has no water uh, and but a lot of sulfur dioxide. So uh, very. Uh, different materials from uh, what you see on Europa, Ganymede, Callisto, and and the others, mm. uh, and uh, uh, and uh, it has these um, enormous plumes up to 500 kilometers uh, that uh, erupt from the surface. So there is something exciting happening on Io all the time uh, that makes mapping it quite difficult because. Uh, you look at Io with one spacecraft and then it changes. In fact, it, it changes can, uh, in months. Uh, we can have a big eruption that deposits a lot of material on the surface and you think, oh, it doesn't look like, you know, it used to. <laughs> so there is always something happening on Io. Yes. Oh, well, thank you both so much for joining us today. Unfortunately, that is all the time that we have. But again, we really appreciate you taking so many questions from our viewers online. Thank you for having me. It's been such a pleasure to talk about it. Thank you. It's really been fun. Uh, so, uh, you know, keep, uh, keep looking at the website. So Juno will do a lot more. Thank you again. And thank you to everyone who joined us online. We hope you enjoyed learning more about the fascinating worlds of Europa and Io. If you'd like to stay up to date on the Juno mission and its study of Jupiter's moons, visit go.nasa.gov forward slash Juno or follow NASA Solar System on Facebook, Instagram, and X. If you enjoyed today's show, you can check back with us tomorrow, March 8th at 11 a.m. Eastern. Dr. Lori Glaze, our Head of Planetary Science at NASA, and U.S. Poet Laureate Ada Lamont will be taking to the stage, kicking off the South by Southwest Festival, chatting about our Europa Clipper mission, which is launching later this year to see if Jupiter's icy moon has conditions suitable for life. Visit go.nasa.gov forward slash Europa Clipper SXSW to watch live, and you can stay tuned for a special surprise. Thank you all and see you next time.